There are hunters, and there are those who hunt the hunters. You'll know who I am. <laughs> You'll know what I do for a living. <laughs> Frank Mundus landed some of the largest great white sharks ever recorded. No fish was too big for him to tackle. He wanted to catch the biggest white shark uh, that he could. I remember 3,427 pounds. It's like a Volkswagen. That was a big fish. Like a real life Captain Quint. Quint was fiction. Mundus is reality. His shark hunting stories became legend and may have inspired one of the greatest on screen adventures of all time. That's a 20 footer. 25. Three tons on him. Now at age 78, the retired shark hunter is getting ready for one last adventure. Hello! Not to catch or kill, Hi there, Frank. but to see the great white shark in a whole new way. Oh, I forgot to tell you. See that pile of goo out there they call the ocean? We're gonna go to South Africa. We're down there where the jumping sharks are, and we're gonna play games with them. <laughs> so keep your eye on the program. There we go! No, did you see that? Oh, All the way out of the water! All the way out of the water! Africa. It's the beginning of a trip of discovery for the legendary shark hunter Frank Mundus who hasn't caught or even seen a great white shark up close in nearly 15 years. The bones don't move like that no more, you know? You gotta loosen them up, man. <laughs> Frank is warming up for a face-to-face -face encounter with South Africa's famous flying sharks, great whites that explode from the water to hunt seals. Now that I'm 78 years old, <laughs> I didn't think I would ever have the chance to see the white sharks again, nevertheless jumping white sharks. Frank saw his first great white in the waters off Montauk, New York in the 50s, and instantly he was hooked. He became the only fisherman on the East Coast to target sharks and built a successful charter business catching a fish that, at the time, no one else wanted. Nobody really thought about sharks. Nobody wanted to catch sharks when we first started fishing in 1951. It was considered snake hunting. It was considered collecting garbage. He created a whole industry that didn't exist, and he was the pioneer. He was the first person to do this. Frank called it monster fishing. It was a way to lure customers onto his boat and show them firsthand that the shark was a world-class game fish that was fun to catch. We had to nickname it monster fishing because we couldn't call it shark fishing. If we said that we was going to take you out shark fishing, you'd turn around, run up the dock, and jump in your automobile and go. You would always come to me and say, Frank, you know, the only thing we caught today was sharks, but we had so much fun. What do you say the next time we go shark fishing? We called the people idiots who fished with us because, first of all, they had to be an idiot to climb on the boat and go fishing with us. Second of all, according to all the other boats, they had to be an idiot to go shark fishing. There were so many idiots, they would line up around the block. Frank would be booked a year in advance. They always wanted bigger fish and more of them. And Frank was there to accommodate them. Where could the average worker go to catch a fish over 100 pounds? Couldn't afford to go to Acapulco, but he could afford to go to Monta. This became the big game fish for uh, the average guy. If you wanted to catch a big fish, you better be fishing for sharks. Hunted and hated. There was little sympathy for the creatures considered man-eaters. In those days, people hated the sharks. When we would bring in a decent-sized shark, there'd be 50 people on the dock jumping up and down, hollering, hooray, hooray, Mondays brought in another shark. 
Hooray, kill them all. Kill all them buggers, right. A good shark was a dead shark. It's an overworked term, but that was essentially the situation in the, in the early 60s. So if you brought in sharks, everybody thought it was really great that you did. You're reducing the danger to man. Today, as a reformed shark hunter, Frank has been invited to South Africa by Chris Fallows, one of the country's most outspoken shark conservationists. I'm Chris Fellows, I work with white sharks, and together with my wife, Monique, we now specialize in white shark photography. Chris Fellows. Hey, Frank Mundus, yeah, monster man. Know, Good huh? to meet you. Oh, nice, Welcome to South Africa. Nice to be here. Uh, obviously, anybody who kills white sharks is not my favorite person on earth, and uh, having done everything I can to conserve these magnificent animals, I could never understand how someone can go out there and just kill them to hang them up on a dock. When you're fishing and you have customers, it's entirely different because the customers want to catch the fish. Lots of times I don't want to catch the fish. Lots of times I'll take my hat off to the fish that swims away. We lost them. I think this meeting with Frank gives me the opportunity to, you know, let him know what my feelings are and show him how a different generation looks at sharks. This was from a, a four-meter shark that was actually left the tooth in the decoy. It's still alive. So oh, well, I've got you got yours the right way. I got mine the wrong way, you see. Well, I had the, the poor, poor thing died. Well, we're going to change that. We're going to show you white sharks in a whole different light. In South Africa, great whites were nearly wiped out by fishermen in the early 1990s. Today, great whites are coming back. From Simonstown Harbor, it's a short boat ride to Seal Island, where up to 30 white sharks prowl the waters hunting for fur seals. For Frank, this is a fantastic opportunity to see what mine and my wife's world's all about. What we look out for every morning is these incoming seals. Uh, young ones are really prone to being hit. Seal Island is undoubtedly the best place on Earth to see natural predation. The area we're in right now is what we call the Ring of Peril. It's where most of the seals get killed by the white sharks. Uh -huh. On a morning, you can see several natural predations, and it's what my wife and I find so fascinating. So what you've seen on TV, where the sharks that, come flying yeah. out the yeah, water yeah, to catch the seals. Pretty. We've got 64,000 Cape fur seals there as well as a healthy population of white sharks that use certain behavior see nowhere else in the world to catch them. They actually come up at terrific speed and breach completely out the water, which makes for one of the most fascinating sights in all of nature. And that female there, she's been hit by a white shark probably two to three days ago. It's healing up quite nicely. The first impression of Seal Island, I got into my mind through my nose. <laughs> There are a lot of seals on that island. I see now why there's no trees growing on the island. <laughs> <laughs> too many, there's too many seals. Too many seals. <laughs> and there's not a tree and there, the, look. And the seals don't enjoy climbing trees anyhow, so. <laughs> when you look at that island, you see all that, all that bait, I call it bait, because that's what it is. The white shark wants a seal, and he'll hang around, hang around, hang around, until he gets a chance to get one. Hopefully we're going to show you a different side of the white shark that you've never seen before. That's right, it will be. For 50 years, the legend of shark hunter Frank Mundus grew in the waters off Montauk, New York. Locals nicknamed him Monster Man, and it wasn't just because of his shark fishing. I think he was a character among characters. Montauk was sort of famous for captains who were, well, independent, but their own men he was head and shoulders above all of them. You had the whole range of, I like him, I hate him. He's a great guy, he's a no good SOB. Unforgettable, obnoxious, <laughs> um, charming at times. Dan Levin, a staff writer for Sports Illustrated, wrote about Mundus in 1983. I didn't have to exaggerate when I wrote about Frank. I just wrote about uh, some of the things he'd done and they were literally unbelievable and I spoke to some of the people who fished with him and the stories they told were the stuff of legend and this is why Frank became a legend. He even painted his toenails and one was red and one was green. A safari hat he had, earrings, he probably started the earrings that the kids wear today. Arrogant, 
nasty, probably one of the craziest people I've ever met. Probably the only person I knew that has got thrown out of more places a month talk than me. Every time somebody climbed on the boat, they would always ask me, are you in your right mind? And I would say no. If I was, I wouldn't take you out. There was a lot of grousing about Frank over the years, but I think ultimately what they concluded, and this is the feeling they had, was he's a nut, but he's our nut. Back in South Africa, Frank and shark photographer Chris Fallows look for great whites by following a group of outward bound seals. The seals use highly evolved anti-predatory strategies to get away from the shark. We're going to be following this young number two over here. It's a, a Cape fur seal in its first year of life. So when the seals leave, they leave in groups. And these groups are constantly jostling to confuse their predator. So yeah, it's porpoising, but yeah. it's porpoising in all the wrong areas. Yeah. Oh, jeez! Yeah. Oh. Holy smokes! Once the shark has singled out a, a single prey item, an individual seal, if the seal is lucky enough to escape the initial strike, that seal will get as close to the white shark as it can, not allowing the white shark to line up and actually focus in on it, using its mouth to catch it. And you get these twisting, turning battles going on that are truly fascinating to see. Look out, look out, the little guy's trying to get right on top of the shark so yeah, the shark yeah, doesn't yeah. get him. Oh, oh no, he didn't make it. He oh, didn't make man. it. Nuh-uh, not that time. Shame, they try so hard, those little seals, but the sharks are just so experienced. Yeah, blood all over the place. Holy jeez, look at that. Wow. Frank's reaction was really great. I mean, you're talking about a guy that's been involved with white sharks for decades and seen much on the water. And he was really, really impressed and excited by this fantastic sight at Seal Island. It was quite a sight to see that shark kill that seal. You felt sorry for the seal, but there's nothing you can do. Back in your day, things were obviously very different, and people used to hunt and kill sharks right. for sport or whatever the, the means. How do you feel about sharks now? Well, uh, I got to love them the same way you did. Chris has a very strong feeling about the shark, and he wants to help him out the best he can, but he is the lucky one. He is there, and he is doing it. About a 10-foot shark came about five foot out the water, flew right out the water. It was unbelievable. About 200 yards from us. The best one I've seen this year. Oh, well, the only thing I've seen was the hole. But you got to wake <laughs> up, man. No, was... In days gone by, they might have wanted to kill sharks, but now he realizes what he's done was wrong and, you know, wants to see them in the oceans living. Nowadays, everybody's a conservationist, even myself. Frank will most likely be remembered as a source of inspiration for the infamous Captain Quint. Jaws author Peter Benchley fished with Mundus in 1966 and later wrote the novel that featured an obsessed shark hunter. Yeah, I even modeled Quint around me, but the only problem was he didn't make him ugly enough. <laughs> Quint would, as you remember in the movie, he scratched a blackboard and he says, you all know me, you all know what I do for a living. Well, everybody knows me and my boat and they know what we were. We're both mavericks, so to speak. Uh, we both do something that nobody else wanted to do or nobody else would do, and that is to go shark fishing. Quint was fiction. Mundus is reality. So what they did is they took Mundus the reality, the real man, and then they bastardized him or they modified him to become Quint the character. There was a lot of stuff that happened in the movie Jaws that was right out of Frank's book. Frank wrote Sport Fishing for Sharks in 1971. From the looks of the boat to the, you know, some of the things that they did in the movie um, were similar to what would really happen, but most of them were exaggerated. Years ago, when this was going on, Frank was drinking pretty good, and he could be nasty. And that's the way Quint was portrayed. In Frank's drinking days, he probably reminds us more of Quint uh, with that, that type of swagger, the drinking in the daytime kind of a thing, and his determination to win at all costs over the shark. 
Mundus and Quint also shared a hatred for the two-way radio. No matter how big the shark or how dangerous the predicament, neither captain would think of calling for help. All my customers that knew me knew I hated the radio. I never turned it on. Parker, come in. One of the customers would say, well, why don't we radio for help? Coast Guard, this is the Orca, do you? The first guy that touches that radio is going to get a broken arm. Excuse me, Chief. Most of the people in Montauk, and certainly Captain Frank, felt that, that, that Quint was patterned after him. And in fact, some of his earlier landings of big sharks with harpoons and so on are very similar to what happened in the movie. One of his earlier landings was this 4,500-pound great white that Mundus harpooned after a harrowing experience at sea. The 4,500-pound fish that we got in 1964, that was the best part, the best part of the movie Jaws. In the 1971 book, Sport Fishing for Sharks, there's a detailed account of his 4,500-pound fish where they stuck many barrels in the fish. One time I got a 16-footer off Montauk. Had to stick two barrels in him. Where the boat was having trouble. Uh, just like the movie Jaws, where they had to fire up the engines, chase the barrels down, shut the engines off. All right, stop the boat. Stop the boat! We had motor trouble on the way out. Uh, one of our impellers in the saltwater pump went bad. It'll only go about three inches. All of our injectors got scored from the saltwater in the fuel. Uh, the big fish showed up. But I told him, mate, I said, I can't chase them. Let me see if I can get the pump changed. The customers are jumping up and down. They want the fish. They want the fish. They want to get them. So I told them, even if, if we do hop on them, there's no guarantee that we get them. So we hop on them. We threw the barrel right from the cockpit. We let all the line go out, 400 feet, a quarter inch line. The barrel went. And then we sat there and we worked on the motor until the barrel was almost over the horizon. Start the engine! I could start and run for about five minutes and then shut off the motor again. With his boat in trouble, Mundus continued firing harpoons into the 17-foot shark. The crew would play tug of war with this giant for three hours before finally landing one of the largest great whites ever caught. We put five harpoons in them, four barrels, we hung on to everything, and that was it. Today, the shark they call Big Daddy hangs in a Montauk bar, where patrons can still be heard comparing it to the man-eater in Jaws. There's no comparison, because we brought the fish back, and in Jaws, I think the fish ate the boat. Frank continues his quest to rediscover the Great White at a fishing village called Haunts Bay. Here, he'll meet a local shark legend known for his close encounters with the animals. The next stop on my African journey will be to see Andre Hartman. Uh, I think that uh, that's going to be a, a blast to watch him work with the white sharks. Andre Hartman is known for nose lifting a uh, white shark up in the air and I, when he does, the white shark will uh, open his mouth. And uh, uh, from the photos that I've seen, it, uh, it's going to be a blast. From Haunts Bay, a fleet of dive boats depart for Dyer Island, where shark fanatics can find one of the heaviest concentrations of white sharks on the planet. Hey, Frank Mendes. Welcome to South Africa, man. Hi. Yeah, I was very excited meeting this monster man. You know, it's, it was just it was just great. I hear we're going out there to uh, find some white sharks, right? Yeah, we'll definitely get some. He was a character that Clint was based on by Peter Benchley in the film Jaws. Everything that he put in the movie Jaws came right off my boat. In the post-Jaws era of the late 70s, when phantom sharks patrolled the shallows of every beach, Mundus became a folk hero by evening the score with mankind's most dreaded enemy. This was a time when sharks were hated. So Mundus and his crew did their part to rid the ocean of these much maligned animals, whether by bullet, hook, or harpoon. I would have them hanging on pulpits, front pulpits, side pulpits, 
I'd just cut their bellies open. I'd have maybe 20 sharks. Uh, a couple of the big ones I'd keep on the deck for trophies. We didn't waste the sharks. I would cut them up into chunks, and we'd save them for the next trip. That's chum. It didn't take us very long to realize that we were killing too many fish. We were bringing in too many fish. It is really a shame to kill a fish that's that big, uh, just to bring them in and say that you caught them and flop them on the dock. I feel sorry for the fish, even though we win. I always felt sorry for my opponent if I won. Now, Frank Mundus is about to come face to face with the great white shark once again, this time in the waters off South Africa. Though the great white is often shy and elusive, they take on a different personality in the Dyer Island Channel. The great whites are here to hunt seals. And the channel is so abundant with sharks, it's been nicknamed Shark Alley. Frank's tour guide for the expedition is local shark expert Andre Hartman, who is about to give Frank his closest look at a great white in 15 years. Few people on Earth know more about getting close to these sharks than Andre, who has logged over 1,000 dives with these animals without a cage. My job used to be to catch them on rod and reel when I was sport fishing. Right. And you are that different because you like to go down there with them and swim around with them. Yeah, I started doing this diving just to, to want to learn more about them. One day I just jumped in next to the cage and he does nothing, he doesn't even see me, so I move a little bit further out and then he comes and has a look and goes around and that's how we started. You know when the visibility is clean and the sharks are beautiful, you just feel like, hey, I want to hop in there and have a look closer. Yeah, but you still have to keep a close eye on oh, yeah. them. Oh, yeah. Well, to keep from being attacked, I use a spear gun to tap them. Sometimes I just have to move the gun in front of his eye and it veers off. But sometimes you can see some sharks are pretty mean. They'd rather not get in the water. Wait for a nice, relaxed shark. Yeah, I hope that uh, we can get out there and uh, see some action today. You're going to see some action. We've got lots of sharks here. Yeah. It's not every day the same, but today it looks like a good day. Big ones, small yeah, ones, ones. medium-sized ones, the all whole kinds. Lot, the whole all lot. kinds. With thousands of young, inexperienced seals in the water, Shark Alley is a paradise for predators. So there must be a lot of white sharks in that area. Hey, yeah. Oh, we don't feed them here. Yeah. No. Hardly ever. Right. Sometimes they, they rush in and grab the bait without you being able to pull it away. Hey. When they want it, you cannot get it away from them. If they want it, then. That's the end. That's the end. <laughs> so tell me, do you uh, get the same feeling, the same respect for these animals as what I do? I used to be petrified of these guys. Now I look at them with a different eye. I can't get enough of how beautiful it moves through the water. Right. That's just like, wow. Right. And every time I can do it 20,000 days in a row, and when I see another one, same feeling comes over. Right. Every right. time. It is, it is. The hard part about my business was I had to catch them. Yeah. I couldn't play with them. My yeah. customers wanted to catch them. Yeah. So after you catch a 3,000 pound fish and you put them on the dock, everybody has, says, hooray. I don't feel hooray. Yeah. I feel sorry for the animal. We, we killed him and that's it. You can't catch him no more. You can't play with him no more. It's done, finished. While working with these sharks, Andre discovered a spectacular behavior. Fending the shark off with a hand to the snout sometimes caused the jaw to drop wide open. Experts have described this mysterious behavior as a form of frustration. He thinks the bait is now your hand. And when you lift your hand up, he follows it because he thinks the bait's going up. All of a sudden now, there's something stuck to his nose and he reaches for it. There he is over here, coming that way again, he's going right for your bait. Oh, but that's another, that's going a different right shot. Right for your bait. All right, watch out. The 
first time snout touching ever happened is the sharks would come in around the back of the boat and start biting the engines. So we started fending them off, pushing them away. Take your time. No rush. Take your time. That's it. I don't Good think point. that the shark is trying That's to bite them. I think that the, the shark is probably doing the same thing that you would do as a human if somebody grabbed you by the nose and lifted your head up. Your mouth is going to automatically open up. Well, it's happened a couple of times that my hand slipped and it slips right in between those teeth and you get cut pretty badly. If you did slip and your hand went down into the side of his jaw, it would be uh, uh, all mince meat by the time you got it out. Ninety-nine people out of a hundred wouldn't even attempt it at all. The one idiot that did try it, if he didn't know what he was doing, my chances are he's going to get hurt. And just when you think you got him figured out, they'll make a liar out of you. Always. Always. <laughs> Andre, listen, I want to thank you for taking me out to Dyer Island. It was a blast to see all them sharks swimming around. I think uh, Frank, you know, being an, an old shark hunter, I think he really enjoyed just watching these sharks perform without having to catch them. Before I go, I want to give you my Monster Man book, and I hope that you enjoy it. It's a lot more fun playing games with him than it is catching them, because he'll be there tomorrow. He'll be there tomorrow when we play with him. But in the 1980s, hunters played a different kind of game with the Great White. For Frank, the object of that game was catching the largest shark on record. I remember 3,427 pounds, it's like a Volkswagen. And I remember how big it was because it was laid out on, on two sheets of plywood. It was 16 feet, one inch long. It was a big fish. Frank Mundus belongs to a very special circle, the Schaefer Circle. Because in the war between man and shark, he wins every time. As the world's most famous shark hunter, Frank rode the public's growing fascination with sharks to new heights in the 1970s and 1980s. Come into the Schaefer Circle. Every time you caught one and brought it in and hung it up on the dock, it was advertising. Uh, and he understood advertising. Don't forget, this is in the New York area. Um, there's a tremendous amount of press here. A huge shark comes into Montauk. Next day, the New York Post monster shark threatens population of eastern Long Island, you know, something wild and outrageous. Sharks were big business, but it was the quest for a world record that drove Mundus. Catching a world record white shark would ensure his legacy as the greatest shark fisherman ever. No fish was too big for him to tackle. He wanted to catch the biggest white shark uh, that he could. In August 1986, Mundus would have his chance to make history, hooking a shark nearly 800 pounds heavier than the existing world record. Word had spread that a dead whale, a favorite food of the Great White, floated several miles off Montauk. When Mundus arrived at the carcass, it was riddled with massive bite marks, but with no sharks in sight. Crew members fished off the belly of the giant, waiting for the sharks to return. I was the first one to see the white shark. Everybody was sleeping. When I woke Frank up, and you know, I said, here he comes again. It was about 8 o'clock that night that the first white shark showed up. And he came up and swam around the boat. And you know, we just all went to battle stations. We spent 36 hours there and just watched 12 that I can remember, different sharks come up, take a bite of the whale, shake it, and then um, swim around, a couple laps around the boat, and just settle away. And then we'd wait another hour, and then a different one would show up. I'll never forget it, seeing this big old, old white shark. He grabbed onto that, that whale, and he was just shaking it. And the foam was foaming up, and I'm like, how are we going to catch him? Using whale meat was against the rules. So Mundus baited a hook with fish and hoped the shark would bite. When it finally did, 
The crew faced the fight of their lives. All we did was follow it around, kept the rod bent. He stopped out 100 yards out and turned and came right at the boat. As he came to the boat, the leader touched his dorsal fin. The fish went nuts. He rolled up in the leader, just went wild. We didn't think we were going to get him. He stayed on the surface the whole fight. If, you know, if he went down, we probably would have never got him. So we basically, I mean, hand-to-hand -hand wrestled with that thing, you know, putting a tail rope on him. And once we, got a, once we got a tail rope, and then we put another tail rope, and then another tail rope, and then another tail rope on him, um, Frank put the boat in gear, and that was it. It was all over for the shark we had him. They had the shark, but Mundus could not be sure of a world record. The only option was to tow it in and find a scale large enough for this remarkable giant. I've seen huge sharks, but I've seen nothing to compare to this. It didn't look real. It was so enormous. A dead whale floats in the Atlantic, attracting more than a dozen hungry great whites. Shark hunter Frank Mundus and crew are hoping to draw one of the sharks away from the whale. After 36 hours, they succeed. A massive, possible world record shark is hooked and landed. Now they would tow it home for an official weigh-in. This one we had to call in ahead of time for two reasons. One, we had a possible war record. The other reason was I knew somebody had to get in their car, some volunteer, and they had to travel halfway down Long Island to get the big commercial scale that weighed up to 5,000 pounds. When I did the word travel around Montauk like wildfire, when we got back to the dock, there was over 1,000 people on the dock at midnight. We had to elbow our way through. Right, to get to the dock and to the boat. There had to be a couple of thousand people standing there. And this is, again, late at night. People have always been fascinated with sharks. And something that size, you're gonna have a ton of people. When we brought the white shark back to the dock, it was, it was quite the circus atmosphere. They got that fish on the dock and, and flopped it on the dock. They weighed it. I remember 3,427 pounds, it's like a Volkswagen. And, and I remember how big it was because it was laid out on, on two sheets of plywood. It was 16 feet, one inch long. And the girth, I believe, if I'm correct, it was 12 foot something inches. If you went in head first, you'd go right in there. Your shoulders would have fit inside his mouth. That was a big fish. When they took the weight, it came out at 3,500 pounds. I remember Frank jumped and he's sitting motionless. He jumped up off the motor box and pumped his fist like that. It was, it was a great moment. But the celebration was short-lived. The International Game Fish Association, or IGFA, which monitors sports fishing records, ruled against Mundus and his crew. They were fishing around a dead whale. IGFA says you can't use any kind of mammal meat for chum or bait. Uh, he didn't. He caught that on a fish bait. But because the fish were attracted to the whale, they disqualified that fish. I think Frank probably um, is a little disappointed that the IGFA did not recognize that. I say this to this day, you know, we're not in the IGFA record, but we flopped it on the dock. And that's Frank's language, we flopped it on the dock. We're not bitter about the record, about the fact that the fish never made the record books, but that still is the largest fish ever caught on rod and reel. After the big great white, Frank began to think of retirement. Times had changed. He was once the only shark fisherman in Montauk. But now, after Jaws, it seemed that everybody wanted to catch sharks. After the movie Jaws came out, all the other boat captains was automatically experienced a shark fisherman. For a while, there were enough sharks for everyone. But as the boats continued their daily slaughter, the sharks became harder and harder to find. The charter boat themselves was killing a lot of fish. For instance, if you had 100 boats fishing for sharks at a Montauk point alone, each boat killed 10 sharks that day. That's 1,000 sharks that are killed they killed a lot of sharks, and I got blamed for it. I really got blamed for it. 
But that's all right. Let them think what they want to think. He respected these fish a great deal. He uh, realized that there were conservation problems. He slaughtered too many at the beginning, I think. But towards the end, I think that tapered off and it was much less. Frank continued fishing, but instead of killing what he caught, he began releasing the majority of sharks alive. He pioneered the use of a circle hook designed to catch in the shark's jaw, making it easier to release the animal unharmed. Anybody who goes fishing, you kill fish. As a result, that's what you're doing. Uh, but what they don't know is how many fish we released, how many fish we let go. So all they see is what we bring to the dock and flop up on a dock. Many of the sharks that Frank did bring back were not wasted, but turned over to shark biologists for study. Jack Casey was the chief of Apex Predator Investigations for the National Marine Fisheries Service. Frank Mundus provided us with information that gave rise to some scientific questions on age and growth, food habits, distribution, migrations, that then we were able to follow up on. Working with Casey, Mundus implanted ID tags in the backs of sharks, a first-of-its-kind study. We wanted to see where the fish was going, how far they was going, are they local fish? If you ask me, was Frank a conservationist later in his career, uh, I would say yes, because he was releasing more of his sharks than he was bringing in. Everybody knows about uh, Frank's 40,000 sharks, or however many he ended up catching ultimately, but I think what they don't realize is the number of sharks that he tagged and released. Very important for research to know where these sharks are caught, what their size is, uh, what their sex is, and where they go next, which is critical to determine how we can protect the species. What the tagging program eventually revealed was what Frank Mundus predicted years before. Sharks were in serious decline. In the early 60s, a tournament might land a thousand sharks in two days. A thousand blue sharks, right off Long Island. Now, if you, if you could run those same tournaments and land 25 sharks, you'd be doing well. The best available data suggests that, depending on the species, that the populations have been reduced up to 80 percent. But sports fishing for sharks was only partly to blame. The real culprit was an invasion of commercial shark fishing boats fueled by a ravenous demand for shark fins coming from the Orient. Once the commercial fishery opened up for the meat and for fins, specifically for fins, the sharks were heavily impacted by intensive fishing effort. That was really what reduced the populations. The sharks that were once so abundant in these waters nearly disappeared by the early 1990s. For Frank, it was a bittersweet ending to a career at sea that had endured for half a century. I told my customers 20, 30 years ago, I could see the decline. And I told my customers, pretty soon when you go fishing, you're gonna go fishing for fun. If you catch a fish, it's gonna be a bonus. As far as I'm concerned, there's no more fish left, really. And I don't wanna go for a boat ride. In 1991, Frank stepped off his boat for the last time. The end of an era in Montauk, as the notorious shark hunter headed for retirement. Frank was the last of the great white shark hunters, <laughs> the last of the great uh, uh, extremists of, of the sport. I don't think there will be another, another Frank. Um, some people will say that's a good thing. Some people will have a little regret when they, when they think of that, though. Now retired, Frank Mundus is preparing for a final trip to South Africa. This time he'll join Chris Fallows for a special surprise. This is Frank the decoy, and we're going to see what the Watch Dogs think of you. Now. A lot of my customers would like to see me out on the street. But will Frank the decoy entice the white sharks to jump? Well, no luck yet, Frank. Or will it take a special trick from an old shark hunter to make a great white fly? Yeah, look. look, look, look. You sure it doesn't look like a seal in drag? Well, I don't know. We'll find <laughs> out. There we go! Oh, can you see that? Oh, All the way out of the water! All the way out of the water!
After 50 years of chasing the great white shark, Frank Mundus retired to Hawaii. Now 78, Frank, his wife Jenny, plus a dog, goats, and a wild boar named Arnold, live on a farm 2,000 feet above shark level. When I was a kid, my mother said that I couldn't play in the dirt, I'd get dirty. So I promised myself that when I did retire, sell a boat, and I was going to buy a farm, and I could play in the dirt all I wanted. No, I said no. OK, OK, good boy. We both have an interest in animals and raising baby animals, and he does have a sensitive side. He's very fond of like when the sheep have babies and the goats give birth, and it's kind of interesting and amusing to see this tough, rugged man holding a, a baby sheep. Stop, Joe. Behave yourself. <laughs> Though he's not set foot on a boat for many years, the sea is still in Frank's blood. With help from Jenny, he's writing his third book, an autobiography he calls 50 Years a Hooker. But the final chapter remains to be written. For Frank, the perfect ending is not retirement, but one last adventure with the jumping sharks of False Bay, South Africa. Returning to Seal Island and the infamous Ring of Death, where seals often fall prey to great whites, Frank will now join Chris Fallows as he prepares to launch a seal decoy. We tow decoy at Seal Island on an irregular basis to elicit breaches. We don't do it very often at all. We don't want to waste the white shark's energy. But once in a while, we still have a little fun and see what reactions we can get. For a conservationist like Chris, inviting a once notorious shark hunter to Seal Island has been a valuable learning experience. Frank is undoubtedly a, a very knowledgeable man in certain fields pertaining to sharks. Like he attracted sharks to catch him, I attract sharks to look at them and you know photograph them. I try and learn as much as I can from the man in terms of you know, how to attract certain species of sharks or anything like that so that I can go out there and photograph them and, you know, help conserve them. Okay, what we've got here is our decoy, and I hope you don't mind, and I've taken the liberty of naming it after you. <laughs> this is Frank the decoy, and we're going to see what the white sharks think of you now. A lot of my customers would like to see me out on the string. Yeah, well... Especially with a white shark chasing me. Name me on Frank, I figure he probably thought, well, here's the chance for the white shark to to get back at Frank Mundus. Bing, eat him up. <laughs> we obviously started this off as a research project and we occasionally do it now. We don't like to do it too often because we don't want the white sharks to waste too much energy. But uh, hopefully we get to show you something really spectacular and really beautiful as the white shark in the air is one of the most awesome sights in nature. I have a little bit of an idea I'd like to try later along the lines of fishing, okay? Right. So uh, it might work. We'll see what happens. We'll give, give it a give it a go, like they would say. All right, we give it a What is that idea? Well, I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to show you. Not just yet. No, no, I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to show you. Super, okay? I look forward to it. Let's okay. give it a go now. Okay. Well, we're in the perfect area here. It's the area we call the Ring of Peril, and it's where the sharks catch most of the seals every day, so... Keep focused on that decoy there. This is a really good spot. All right, let them come. I'm ready. So you're feeling lucky today, Frank? I feel lucky every day. But after two solid hours of towing, no sign of a great white is seen. Sensing no predators in the area, a real seal trails after the decoy. As Frank knows, some days the sharks don't bite. Well, no luck yet, Frank. Well, we gotta keep trying. Not every day a, a coconut, but... Uh, That's what they say, it's fishing, not catching. We keep going. That's it. Catching fish all my life, you get the feeling that if you give the fish a, a bait or an imitation bait that looks too good, a lot of, ch lot of times they will not hit it. Borrowing a technique from his old fishing days, Frank ties pieces of fabric on the seal. 
Chris is skeptical, but up until now, the sharks have had no interest in the decoy. Uh, imitation bait that looks too real, make it look like it's crippled a little bit by tying something on it. Guarantee, you put this in front of the white shark, he's not going to pass it up. There are certainly techniques and a lot of knowledge that he's got that I don't have um, in terms of how to attract sharks and that sort of thing. So I'd like to take away that sort of knowledge from him. What are we doing to Frank? Well, we made him look crippled. When that is in the water and starts to go ahead to the white shark, it looks like some of his insides have gotten loose. And therefore, he'll be a cripple and easier to catch. Are you sure it doesn't look like a seal and drag? Well, I don't know. We'll find <laughs> out. Oh, right, give it Put a go. Put him in the water and watch give him wiggle. Give it a go. Watch him wiggle. A white shark breach is probably the pinnacle of watching sharks in the wild. I think I got oh. about 10 frames there. That was Good so beautiful. Oh, buddy, man. That was pretty. That was pretty. Oh, when a one-ton yeah. animal comes flying out the water, you can only but be spellbound. The beauty is amazing, as well as the incredible athletic ability and strength that it takes to lift itself so high out of the water. The decoy was a success. For Mundus, the art of attracting sharks hasn't changed in 50 years. From underneath, when the white shark looks up, he sees this other material hanging, dangling around on the seal. So therefore, he figures that he's crippled. It's fooled the white shark because they come up and hit it hard. Coming from a guy that's had such a notorious history with working with huge white sharks, for us it was very satisfying to see that they could get so much pleasure out of seeing a living animal do something naturally. Well, Frank, it's been good to meet you. Great. My wife and I have enjoyed taking you out there and showing you what is very special to us, our flying great white sharks. Oh, a shark fisherman and a shark conservationist can get along very well. Just to say cheers, I'd like to give you this. I'll show you. It's one, oh, of, our, that's nice. one of our special animals. That is nice. That's a nice so, animal. Up in the air. Look at him go. Pretty. Fifteen years ago, Frank Mundus walked away from fishing. But his journey to see the great white shark has reignited an old flame. At his farm in Hawaii, he's now preparing for a return to the fishing grounds off Montauk. But this time, his plan is to launch an environmentally friendly catch and release shark tournament. A fitting legacy for the last of the great white shark hunters. Frank will be remembered as the greatest shark fisherman ever. And I don't even like the guy. <laughs> <laughs> if there's a fish to catch, Frank caught it. Simple. The best there is of what he did. He was the greatest shark fisherman in the world. Some people came to fish and thought they were just gonna go out and, and slaughter tons of fish, but I think it was, it was really the adventure. Um, and that's what, that's what Frank gave people, was the adventure. It's the challenge. It's the challenge of catching something big, something decent. Uh, I don't know what we're going to catch, a mermaid or a sea serpent or something, but <laughs> we'll go out there and try and catch something. If I was a great white, I wouldn't bite you, but I'd swim right next to you and ask you how you do. If I was a great